Um, let me see if I can remember uh, what it was. Uh, Z Turbo. Isn't there supposed to be a search function here? Maybe command method. Uh, it was Z Turbo, right? Oh, Z F Turbo. Okay. There we go, this guy. All right, cool, let's see if this is it. And it looks like it, okay. All right, so this is the script that I gave you guys. Um, I'm just gonna go through it line by line to tell you like what exactly it does um, uh, for people who haven't um, did that already. Um, there are a couple of, uh, couple of things that require you to Google search if you don't know what it is, like uh, if you don't know what default dict is or what item getter does or any largest does. Those, I think, are a little bit new. Um, but everything else should be relatively um, uh, intuitive. Um, and, and it doesn't really take that much, I guess, uh, mind wrangling in order to understand. Uh, so basically what this guy does is, uh, as a high level overview, is to split the entire grid of the 10 by 10 kilometer space of points that we have uh, into smaller grids so that we can run, um, uh, like, it, like so we can, um, for example, uh, look at, smallest subsection of the, uh, of the grid, and for example, like this area over here, it only computes the, the total number of businesses in that particular area, uh, so that we don't need to like sample through the entire size of the grid, but only a smaller size, uh, and that requires uh, less memory. Um, uh, and a faster, faster runtime. So um, the first, uh, first function that he provides is this uh, prep x, y function. Um, so it get, it, you uh, feed it two inputs, x and a y, um, and our data set has those coordinates, x and y. Uh, we have a range, which uh, indicates, in this case, how many, I guess, cells that we have. And then uh, this function, can anybody tell me what this function tries to do? raise your hand or something like that. Like range times x, what does that do? <coughs> Again, I'm trying to bring, the, bring more interaction out of this class so that <laughs> I'm not the only one uh, speaking. And again, these answers are not complicated. Come on, you guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh, zero to uh, yeah, some seven ninety nine essentially. Uh, so range times x. Uh, so the uh, min value of x is zero and the max value of x is ten. Uh, if you think about it, like uh, uh, in terms of like mins and maxes only, eight hundred times zero is zero. Eight hundred times ten uh, is eight thousand. Uh, and then we just divide it by ten, and then floor it, uh, and then we suddenly have a range of values between zero and 799. So uh, this IX basically stands for some kind of point uh, that we transform uh, from the zero to 10 axis to a zero to 799 um, <coughs> axis. Uh, and this is the equivalent for the Ys as well. So uh, visually, uh, oh, I should probably write this down as a bit larger. Um, but visually, originally it was from zero to 10. Uh, now it's zero, uh, this point is 799. Uh, instead, uh, and then each of these points represent the increments of each point on the grid. And then same, uh, same for the y, y value. So essentially we have now uh, a grid size of 800 by 800. Does everybody understand that part? Cool. All right, so next comes the, uh, well, his function of writing the, uh, running the uh, solution. Um, first thing we, he uses is uh, this open command, which basically opens up the file uh, to, to, for us to access. Um, and f.readline is basically what it says. It reads a line from that file. Um, 
total, uh, what does that do again? Let's see. Uh, it, it's basically, it keeps track of something, but I forgot what it uh, kept track of, but uh, we'll, get, we'll probably get to it um, sooner or later. And then um, these two lines initialize two important things. One um, is the grid that we're, just going, or that we're going to store our, um, our values for, the business ID plus the frequency that occurred in a particular area. Uh, and it uses something called a default dict. Um, for default dict, that's probably not something that you guys learned in CS61A or anywhere else. Uh, when I first uh, looked at this script, I definitely did not know what it was, so I had to search it up. Um, so let's see. Actually, let me just type. Uh, yeah, should be fine. So if you just search on Google what it is, um, come on. All right, so it returns a new dictionary-like object. Um, and if you go through like all of this jumble over here, like slowly, um, and also gives you an example of how it works, basically as a high level like uh, view of what default dict does is that by, it sets, it's the same thing as a dictionary, but it sets something by default automatically. So when you initialize a dictionary, you're not like initializing any particular value. Um, but for default dict, uh, as the name implies, by default, it initializes some value for you, uh, so that you don't need to reallocate. Uh, you don't need to allocate that value um, when you're, uh, like, say, storing new things inside that dictionary. Um, so, in this case, uh, a default dict will get, uh, takes in a function, and this function is basically, uh, uh, well, let's see. Let, let's just ignore that. Let's just look at this one. Uh, default dict int uh, provides uh, the int function, which translates to uh, meaning that we put zeros for every single dictionary uh, value for keys that are unassigned, unassigned at the moment. So when if, uh, we're, we're going to go over it in the code later, but basically when we assign a new key to this default dict, um, the value by default is zero. And so that, uh, that makes things a bit faster uh, uh, computationally um, when we're doing things. Now, uh, the reason why we have two of these is because um, uh, we, we have one default dict and then an internal default dict, uh, and, and the outside default dict, which we will later see, is going to involve, uh, where is it? Uh, here, uh, the coordinates, the, basically the grid point for our ix and iy. So basically, the outer default dict represents this grid space over here, um, and the inner default dict keeps, uh, keep tra keeps track of the business ID. So uh, within this particular grid, we want to have like some kind of table of um, place ID and then um, our frequency. So, so like, I don't know, one, two, three, and then frequency like 100, 80, uh, 72, et cetera, et cetera. So the reason why we have two default disks is so that we can store uh, these two types of data types um, at the same time. And so we can later access it um, uh, when we're going through the actual uh, algorithm. Uh, does anybody have questions about that? Yeah. So the first default dict um, will store, uh, let's say, like uh, in terms of coordinates, like i x i y, um, this point over here represents this grid. All right. Another point, like say here, will represent this grid. So that's the first default dict. And then inside this, uh, inside this uh, default dict uh, is another default dict that uh, corresponds to this data structure over here. Um, and we are trying to store, uh, the keys are going to be the place IDs, and the values are going to be the frequencies of those place IDs, or the number of times that we see that business uh, inside this particular grid. So, um, uh, so at the moment, it might seem a little bit weird, like why why are we doing it this way? But um, I, uh, I so so I'll just go through the uh, go through the rest of the code, and hopefully you realize um, the reason why we set this type of like system up, uh, and it's because it's much easier to uh, subset our data and then increment the frequencies uh, when we get to that part in the code. Uh, which one? Uh, this one? Uh, no. Oh, this one? Yeah, yeah so this one, um, prep x is the helper function. It hasn't done anything yet, 
but it will convert any x value and any y value into this 0 to 799 like, grid system. So originally we had uh, x values from 0 to 10, and now we want to convert it into uh, an ix and iy that corresponds to uh, each of these little indices over here. So for example, if an x point was in this, like, in this region, we're just going to call that uh, to be like the equivalent of this point over here. So that later, uh, when we access this point, we are in theory accessing, accessing all of these points at the same time. It's just a way to store um, something. Uh, which, uh, yeah, yeah, so we're replacing all the original 0 to 10 coordinates into this 0 to 799 uh, grid system. Or you can think of it like in terms of buckets, like uh, we created 800 new buckets and then we fit the uh, 0 to 10 points inside those buckets. And, 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 and this is one dimensional, where in reality we have uh, two dimensions too. So we have 800 times 800 buckets. Cool. Um, all right, so that's the uh, first structure that we have. And then uh, we have another structure, grid sorter, that uh, later you, uh, you see why that we have another dictionary. But this is just a plain old dictionary uh, initialized and has nothing in it. Um, but we get to, get to that uh, when we run the code. So um, here comes the while loop, while one. And uh, this is particularly weird in that like, this would, in theory, mean that it would continue to run forever. Um, luckily, what we're trying to do instead is we're basically reading um, each line of our CSV file. Uh, dot strip is basically, basically means that we trim all the white spaces at the ends of things. So uh, we're, we're just reading a line or, or a piece of string uh, from the file. Uh, uh, okay, so total plus equals to one basically uh, is a counter of how many lines we read. Um, and then this if statement, if line is equal to this empty string over here, we break the, break the while loop. So um, this works given that um, we eventually get to some kind of end in the file. Uh, all right, so line now contains the, well, in this case, the first line of our uh, CSV. Um, we split it uh, by the comma. So this is a CSV file or comma separate uh, uh, values file. So every single value is separated by commas, uh, which means that we can uh, split all those values and turn, in, turn them into, uh, into a list with uh, elements uh, corresponding to each value uh, ca called ARR. So, um, for example, let's see, um, say we had the head of something, it was, I don't know, blah, blah, that's the ID, uh, an X coordinate of, I don't know, 9.7, Y coordinate of 4.3, um, uh, I don't know, accuracy of uh, 50, and time of like, I don't know, uh, 100,000. So this is going to be our uh, line for the first line. Uh, and then when we split, do line dot split, we're basically converting this into a list of, of all of these things to a 7, 97, 43, 50, 100,000, uh, etc. Uh, actually, I think the IDs are integers, so it should be like I forget. Anyways, uh, it doesn't really matter. Cool, so now we have this list called ARR. And then, um, let's see, next. And then we assign each one of these values to their own variable. So uh, this one will now be assigned to uh, row ID, uh, this one to X, this one to Y, this one to, uh, it's ACC, or accuracy. Uh, this one to time. And uh, as you can see, if you go like through, um, go through this, there's a, I missed one, there's a place ID um, for, the, for the sixth index. Um, but do you guys like see like w w what we're doing here? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, you can use a data frame too, but um, I mean, th this is like, as simple as it gets already. Um, you don't really need to use a data frame. Um, oh yeah, yeah, so um, the other way is to load the entire data file into your system. Uh, this way, just reading everything line by line, we're actually not using a lot of memory inside your machine. So reading something, reading the whatever five million rows into your machine will actually uh, 
uh, hold a lot of space. Um, in this case, we're just we're not reading any all the data. We're just reading every, every single line, and so that uh, requires uh, less less memory and it's uh, more efficient in that regard. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, awesome. So once that's covered, um, and then we run this function prep x y of x and y. So these two things. Um, and then we convert them into the ix and the iy that we want. And these ix and iy correspond to 0 to 799 now. Um, finally, uh, we now use the default dict that we set up initially uh, over here. Uh, we give it uh, the, first, the first key, we give it to be the ix and iy tuple. So uh, for example, um, like, I don't know, tuple will be imagine the first tuple is like some 178 or something like that. Uh, this will go inside uh, the first default dict. And then the second default uh, dict will now uh, provide another key. Uh, and this key will be the place ID. Um, so, so the place ID that we found in this vector um, will go inside here. So let's say it's uh, ABC for, for whatever reason. Now, implicitly, when we are um, storing all of this inside, uh, we have uh, a value for ABC of equal to zero. So um, inside the innermost dictionary, we have ABC um, as the key. And then the value is um, initialized to zero already, which is why when we make this uh, key uh, plus another key, we can increment it by one um, already, because we don't need to uh, initialize anything. Um, the default dict already did that for us. So uh, this, is, this is why like, we use default dicts. Um, and, and otherwise, like, you have to allocate the space um, to put in a number uh, in the first place. And that, make, that's, that becomes a little bit cumbersome. So uh, does, that, does that make sense for people? All right, we, we have one dictionary outside, one dictionary inside. We set the key for the outside and the key for the inside, and then the value is already default to zero, so we just increment by one and say, okay, um, that place ID now has a value of one. Cool, and then uh, that's basically it for that while loop. So this while loop will continue running for every single line, and any, every single time, um, it will convert the X and Y to an IX and IY. Um, if the IX and IY correspond to this 178 tuple exactly, and we saw the same place ID happen again, which meant that two of these businesses uh, were seen in the same grid, then we increment that, uh, that key value pair by one. And we keep on doing that uh, until the very end of the file. So um, do you guys see that by the end of everything, we now have basically uh, this default dict -like structure where it contains all the place IDs and frequencies for every single grid. Make sense? Cool. All right. Um, and then f.close basically just closes the file for us. Um, cool. So there's that. Okay. All right. So now, um, basically, uh, this, this structure is great. Um, now what do we do with that after? Uh, since we're trying to recommend uh, the, well, recommend some kind of place ID um, uh, uh, based on where you located it, x, y, grid, um, as well as like, uh, other factors as well. Um, the most natural instinct is say, well, if I saw something a bunch of times and it happens to be the, it happens to be seen the most amount of times in one particular area, then I will predict that to be uh, the most likely place that that person checked into. Uh, same with the, with the second most frequent place and the third most frequent place. So um, in this competition, we're trying to recommend three businesses, uh, which is why um, in this algorithm over here, we're trying to get out the top three uh, most frequent. Um, businesses for uh, from our table over there. Um, so this for loop for L and grid. Um, so grid is again two uh, two dictionaries. So each uh, so L in this case will refer to this key over here, uh, the I X I Y um, key. And then basically we uh, if you go inside here we access that key, get the items. Um, uh, let's see what's the best way to explain this. Um, get the items. And dot items will give you the this thing over here for all the place IDs and all the um, uh, values associated with it. Um, 
And then we use the function sorted. Uh, and I think, sort, wait, did you guys learn sorted in CS61A or anywhere? Oh, you guys learned that function? Oh, you guys didn't learn that function. All right, so yeah, for sorting lists, it would be like list.sort, right? Uh, or something like that. Uh, I, I did, I did, the reason why I asked is because I didn't know about this. Like, I didn't know that there was this uh, function to list either, so I searched it up. Uh, is it this one? That gives a good explanation. Um, yeah, so it basically does what uh, a dot sort parentheses does, um, uh, except it does not do it in place. So uh, a dot sort parentheses will sort the list in place for you, whereas uh, sorted does not. It will give back another list um, uh, while maintain, ma maintaining the maintaining the original list. Um, an interesting feature about sorted is that you can also give it uh, um, another parameter. Where is it? Uh, 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 you can give it a key that uh, that basically runs this function for every single element of your list before it sorts anything. Um, so let's see, what's a good way of doing this? Um, imagine that you have like a or some kind of class with these names, like student John A. 15, Jane B12, Day B10, uh, and you want to sort this, um, this list of stuff. So uh, you have basically this here. Um, so you can give sorted a key, um, and this key has to be a function. Uh, lambda, so this is, a, uh, this is a, a, a lambda function that you can give it. Uh, student uh, is the parameter that you pass into it um, from student objects. And then you access the age component of that student um, to give to the sorted algorithm to sort all the values. So basically imagine that this function is run on every single, uh, every single one of these things over here. And then uh, in order to give sorted like the, the values to sort with, uh, you give it the actual numeric uh, component that you want it to sort. So in this case, age, which happens to correspond to 10, 12, and 15. Um, and the reason why you can access dot age is because it's is, uh, implemented in a class. But anyways, uh, the high level, like under, uh, the only high level understanding you need to know is that it's trying to access a value for sorted to to get. Um, so down uh, so so if you look over here, we do have a key, and it's called item getter parentheses one. Uh, you, you don't need to know like how, how item getter, getter uh, is implemented, but uh, you can probably intuitively figure out what it does. It gets an item at the first index. Uh, and also, conveniently enough, it gives an example um, in their sorting page of what item getter does um, in, in this particular case. So two will grab the, it's the same thing as dot age. It will grab the second index of every single tuple that we give it, uh, that enter sort based off of that. So, um, does that make sense for people? Um, we're basically going to sort, uh, let's see. Uh, say we have like a bunch of these. Let's see. <coughs> so basically we have a bunch of these things that we're going to give the to sort, um, and then uh, item getter one will get this value over here, this value over here, uh, and then so on and so forth, in order to sort by. Um, uh, and so that will now sort our like list of tuples, um, and then uh, so that's that that's what that does. And then um, this n largest function is another function probably a lot of you haven't heard of before. It comes from the uh, heap Q package, um, and if you just search up what it does, actually, what does it do? Uh, heap Q and I just uh, yeah, that's basically what the name suggests. Um, it's it's just a faster way of getting the um, the top three largest values inside um, your iterable, or in this case, a list of a list of things. So what it returns um, is basically um, like 
if these were the tuples that I got, it would return only these three things. And then we store all of those inside um, grid sorted, uh, which we initialize to be just a dictionary. So uh, let's see. some kind of dictionary. Um, each key, um, it comes from L. So L was originally our I, X, I, Y. So each key will be, I'd say, 178. Um, and then uh, we give it um, the, the top three values, uh, the top three most frequent, bi uh, frequent bi uh, businesses. So uh, this will be, I think it's on list. Um, I think it should be its own. So it will be like um, place ID A, B, C, of comma 100, um, and then another tuple over here, and then another tuple over here, or something like that. And then um, this gets uh, stored in its like dictionary. Um, uh, does that make sense, kind of? Well, we're basically storing the top, like most three most frequent stuff, um, inside its own dictionary that corresponds to uh, this key over here, which represents the grid. Um, the reason why we do that is because uh, once we run the test file and then look up, um, like try to try to figure out, okay, um, if a point is inside this grid, which is the most frequent business, uh, then we can easily access the most frequent businesses over here. All right, so. Let's see. So we run this for every single um, element in the grid that we had, the, the two default dicks that we had. Um, and we store in that in, in, in its own dictionary. Uh, and then that's basically the training part of this code file. Yeah. For each bucket, yeah, each grid area. Cool. Uh, all right, so that's the and that's probably the bulk of it. Afterwards, um, it says here we're generating this submission. It's because we're now uh, reading the test file. Um, and uh, so, let's see. Um, Subfile, osapath.join, submission. Uh, so this will, uh, this is a string plus the date that is currently right now plus CSV. So it's now the CSV file name that we're going to output our uh, submissions for. We'll now have our timestamp. Um, we open up this file that, uh, that we just wrote the name for um, in write mode. Uh, that would be in the variable called out. Um, open up the test.csv file into f. Uh, this should be familiar already, f.reline. And oh yeah, f.reline, the reason why we do this uh, first is because it's reading the headers of the CSV. So um, the actual data is in the second line. So that's what we need to do, f.reline. Um, initially first, um, and then uh, total equals zero, et cetera. Um, and then this function out.write uh, uh, initializes our he uh, head uh, headers for um, the output file. So uh, already for the first line from our uh, uh, submission file, we have row ID, comma, place ID, and then slash N is uh, stands for a new line. And so every single um, thing that we do out.write next will now uh, be the individual rows for our submissions. Um, cool. Again, we have our while loop. Uh, we read each line again as usual. Uh, if the line is an empty string, then we break the while loop. Um, we do all of this again as before. Um, this is for the test data now. Um, and then uh, what we do is we do out.write string row ID. Uh, so row ID will now correspond to one of the um, well, row IDs in the test set. We add a comma. Uh, so now our submission file will be like, uh, uh, row ID, uh, what was that one? Uh, row ID, place ID. Um, and then 
so this is the what the zero thread. And then the first one would be uh, the first row ID of the test CSV, so that I'm just gonna call it like A, B, C, D, E, um, and then the comma or something like that. Uh, so, so um, you get. Your, I hope you guys are getting to feel that we're trying to build this submission file uh, line by line, quite literally line by line. Um, and this is the first. Uh, and this is the first thing that we uh, put inside um, in terms of our data. Uh, this one. Cool. All right. So uh, next, uh, well, he initialized something again uh, as a list. Uh, imagine. Okay. So field is probably going to contain all of. Uh, um, all of our recommendations for the place ID, uh, but let's, let's see. All right, so I X I Y prep X Y X comma Y that will uh, basically turn all of our test CSV X and Y coordinates into the zero to eight hundred system that we had before. Um, let's see, uh, S one converts those two coordinates into its own tuple, and then uh, here's the part where we now access the original um, default or the original. Uh, uh, dictionary that we have that now contains all of our um, predictions. So uh, S1, this tuple, will search for any tuple or key within the grid sorted uh, for a match. If that happens, then, um, it, so, so if that tuple exists in grid sorted, uh, then we get top items. So now we get this thing over here. Uh, so top items is now that list. Um, for i in range len, uh, len of top items, uh, uh, we do, we, we access, uh, uh, let's see, we access, let's see, length i uh, zero, we access these valid, wait, let me see, I might have messed up the, for i, uh, Oh yeah, no, no. Uh, so so we have a list. Um, there's the first one, the first element, the second element, third element. Uh, these elements are tuples. So in order to access um, the place ID that we want to recommend or put into submission file, we first access the first one, which will be the zeroth index, uh, and then this will give us our tuple that we need. And then we need to access the tuple again. Um, by getting the place ID from that tuple. So that's why we have, uh, well, I, the first I in this case is zero, which is this. And then we need to get the place ID that comes first, which is, um, well, in this case, this, A, B, C. Um, and then uh, we first check if that, if this place ID already exists in our submission file. Uh, if it already exists, then we just don't care, we move on. Um, if the length of uh, filled then for, we first check if the length of field uh, is equal to three. So that's what the um, uh, field variable was for. Um, this stores all our predictions for that particular, for, for, for one row ID. Um, if that is length equal to three, we break it. But if not, then what we do first is we write out the prediction, um, this thing, into our output file. So in this case, it will be um, a, B, C, uh, there's a white space over here, but uh, doesn't really matter. Um, and then we append that uh, uh, place ID inside fill. Uh, yeah, let's just that. Over here. Uh, and that's the first loop of the, uh, of the for loop. Uh, and then we continue going through top items uh, uh, and, and, and grabbing the place IDs from the second tuple and the third tuple um, uh, and putting it inside the output file over there. So there should be three unique place IDs over here. Um, eventually we get to the point like ABC, I know Z, F, G, and then uh, ABI or ADI or something like that. Um, and then this field variable will also contain our uh, corresponding prediction. Um, and basically when uh, length field is equal to three, we break this loop. Um, we do a final out.write slash n, so this will give it a new line uh, to move on to the second row. Um, 
uh, and, and then it, be, before we do f dot close or out dot close or f dot close, um, we go through this entire while loop again. We read each test file line, um, line by line, uh, check to see if it exists in, inside our uh, dictionary uh, with our recommendations. If it does, then we grab all the uh, recommendations that we had in that dictionary, um, write it out to the submission file over there, um, and basically close that file, and we are done. This makes yeah. Questions. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, there would be cases where there'd be duplicates for whatever reason, like. The code uh, he runs basically safeguards if there are duplicates and stuff like that, so um, it should be it should be shouldn't be too much of a problem. But uh, does does everybody understand what the benchmark is doing? Yeah. So could it potentially not recommend anything? Yeah. Anything? That's true. It could potentially not recommend anything. Um, so uh, as you go through the benchmark, like this is very very simple. Um, there are a lot of problems with it. Uh, that's one problem with it, uh, and uh, but but it's very fast, easy to run, and relatively speaking, one of the uh, easier scripts to digest. Um, there, there's some scripts out there that literally takes an hour to read and try to comprehend. This one uh, doesn't require it as much. So um, yeah. Any other questions about the script? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this person's method basically just uh, grabs the frequencies of each grid. Um, the code that I'm going to go over next will be my code, and that will involve doing KNN in every single grid. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that um, soon. Any other questions? Yeah. What was the accuracy um, variable again? Uh, accuracy variable? Uh, you mean what it means? Or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Facebook never disclosed what it meant. Uh, okay. uh, we guess that accuracy kind of corresponded to the different cell phones that person would have. So different cell phones will have different uh, GPS like accuracies, what not associated with it. Um, if you were to draw or plot the accuracy frequencies over um, uh, over a plot, you would see something like uh, uh, what was it? Uh, something like that. I don't know. And we roughly said that this was T-Mobile, this was AT&T, and this was, uh, so the names don't really matter. Each one was, each like mode was like its own like, carrier. But like we still don't know if that's true or not. So, yeah, one of the challenges was figuring out what accuracy was and how to appropriately uh, use it inside um, our algorithms. Uh, it turns out that uh, it's very easy to get it wrong. <laughs> yeah. The first what? How to like make it into a as functions? Uh, so. Like it's just comparing against range, right? And range is always eight hundred. So how how is that actually? Uh, so so let's say, um, we have like three values. Um, zero point one, zero point four, zero point nine. Uh. You multiply each one by 800, so this one will be 80. This was this is 320. This one is 720. Um, and what else do we do? Um, oh yeah, now we divide by 10. Okay, maybe it was from zero to seven nine in the first place. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Um, and then after we convert it into those labels, um, we basically now have. So this will be like x, and then we have another set like y, um, and each the, their combination will correspond to like 
this point, this point, this point, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they correspond to like their individual grids or, or cells. And when we are um, reading each line, we're basically converting all the x, y coordinates inside this grid back into this point. So we're just calling all of these points one point. And then we just try to match uh, everything else to that one point, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's, yeah, just, just read the lines, uh, the code line by line, and then you eventually kind of get the procedure. I don't know. Um, any other questions? <laughs> All right, so that was the benchmark. I uh, hope that was uh, educational. And then next we'll look at the code that I have. So if you do git pull and go inside uh, day 13, code day 13, uh, you'll see my, uh, uh, my, my simplified script for uh, doing the KNN grid system. Uh, actually, let me just erase this now. All right, so um, the script that I provide you guys, it, it, you, you can use the script if you want. Um, it's not by in, in any means like efficient, but it gets the job done. Um, so first, like I guess, let's see, what's a good way? I just read it, I just read it from top to bottom. Um, uh, the package I'm gonna use is uh, pandas and numpy plus uh, the k, near, uh, k nearest neighbors uh, classifier that you guys learned before. Um, the second cell, uh, let me just run this. Uh, the second cell is my APK function, or my average precision uh, at K function. Uh, this is what I meant by like choosing a metric and trying to implement it yourself. Uh, I don't know, no, I think this is someone else. Like, I, I'm pretty sure someone on the forums uh, posted their code or their own metric function and just copied it. Uh, I've unfortunately forgot who, but um, this is like a, a simple enough function that uh, like my implementation would have been similar anyways. So um, yeah, so this will, we'll use this uh, later. Cool, um, you, sh you guys should have downloaded the Facebook training set already. Uh, if not, do it now, um, it will take some time. Um, also reading the training file will also take some time too. Uh, this MacBook is 16 gigabytes, so reading this shouldn't be a problem, but I know some of you guys have like four gigabytes and uh, what not, so uh, as an alternative, you can do, you can read like, let's see, what's the uh, parameter? You can read like the top 10,000 rows or something. Not N rows. Yeah, you can set N rows to be like 100,000 or something like that. It'll read only the first 100,000 values for you. Not the best, but uh, it, it, it works. Cool. Uh, all right, so now that I have my train file, let's see what it looks like. Oops. We have our road IDs, x, y coordinates, actually time, place, ID. Okay, cool. All right, um, next what I want to do is, uh, wait, do I actually need this anywhere? Hmm. No, no, I would need it. Uh, so um, the interesting thing about the data set is that time is in minutes. Uh, so what these two lines do is convert the minutes into a date time object. Uh, and that date time object uh, corresponds to, well, it has information about the weekday, the day, the month that correspond to these minutes. And in order, to, in order for that to work, we need to set a baseline date. Um, this baseline date, uh, no one knows, really. So uh, the like you can just set an arbitrary date, like 2014, first day of 2014, uh, and set that as like the beginning, beginning point in time. Uh, there will be a lot of people that write like 1970 or something like that. It really doesn't matter. So you just set your date first, um, and then this is what mp.datetime64 does for the initial date, and then mpd.datetimeindex will basically use the initial date plus um, this function, which will convert the minutes into, well, actual minutes uh, 
uh, for that for the interpretation, um, and then set every single uh, one of these values into um, a daytime object, and we store that into uh, D times. So uh, not terribly important uh, for you guys to understand all the all the what each uh, each uh, function does, but generally that's like what you, uh, the high level overview of what you what you, uh, what you guys should know. So um, cool. After we let me let me read this line real quick. Uh, so that actually, so this cell will actually take some time, unfortunately. Uh, so we'll just let that run. Uh, while it runs, I'll explain what this next cell does. Uh, I create my own grid uh, by setting, um, in this case, this range now refers to um, uh, the range of, let's see. Uh, so, so for example, if this was between 0 to 10, then I'm setting the width of each cell to be 0 0.5 for the x values, and then setting the width of the y cells to be uh, 0 0.25. And so for x, now we have uh, 20 different like grid points or grids. Uh, and then for y, we have 40. So um, uh, w when I initially d uh, did this, that was my way of like, creating the grids. So um, we have an x range. We have a y range. Um, this line uh, is. So FW stands for feature weights. Um, this line uh, exists because we're doing KNN. Um, I am not sure we emphasize it too much, but uh, if you look at uh, our data here, x, y, accuracy, time, uh, et cetera, x and y is going to be between 0 and 10. Accuracy is not going to be between 0 and 10. Uh, accuracy, in fact, I think the highest accuracy was uh, uh, way over 100. I'm pretty sure it was way over 100. Um, so, for example, if we're calculating some kind of distance function of like 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and accuracy of 100, and trying to figure out if it's close to, say, 0 0.4, 0 0.59, and, um, I don't know, 20, this being x, this is y, this is accuracy. Um, this KNN function, if we use just Euclidean distance, it will think that these two vectors are very, very far away from each other because accuracy is at a scale of uh, of hundreds, and this difference, 100 to 20, is already 80, whereas x, y differences are 0.1 and 0.01. So it will uh, think that this, uh, or these two vectors, will be very far each other because the accuracies are, uh, are that much bigger, uh, when in fact we don't actually care about accuracy. Um, well, well in, this, in, in this context, we don't care about accuracy. We actually care about the um, deviations in x and y. So the reason why we have um, this vector here is so that we can, we, we're actually scaling every single x and y coor uh, coordinate to be much bigger than they were already by multiplying it by 500 and 1,000. So uh, where is it? Uh, yeah, so I do that over here in the future engineering section. Um, but yeah, th anyways, that's, that's, what, uh, that's why that line exists. Uh, now here's the part where I think not many of you know, uh, or at least know about mesh grid. But uh, basically, the way I generate grids now is, uh, um, and this is where the inefficiency comes in, that I think uh, is a big problem still. Uh, so, um, let's see, what am I? So, so for our x values, I'm gonna have, um, Buckets between 0 and 40, uh, sorry, 0 and 20. And then for y, we have buckets of 0 to 40. Um, and then my idea of getting each one of these grid points was basically uh, creating first uh, uh, an array of values of 0. Um, let me just check real quick. Um, X weight times. Uh, 5,000 uh, X range. Okay, so what that code does is I set 0 to 5,000 and then uh, X range times, wait, 0 0.5 times uh, 500. So so um, I'm telling this function a range 
to generate a list of values from zero to 5,000 uh, with a step size of 250. So it would be zero, 250, 500, uh, so on and so forth until uh, 470. 4,750. Uh, over there. Uh, and then that's my way of scaling 0 to 10 to this bigger number uh, when we're doing the grids. Uh, we do that, do the same thing for y. So we got 0, 250, 500, 4,750. Um, uh, and then we use a function called mp.meshgrid. And mp.meshgrid uh, will actually, I think it's easier just to show you guys. Uh, so xs is, uh, wait, let me show you what x points is first. All right, so x points is 0, 250, 550. Uh, I actually appended uh, another 250 uh, to the last one, and I'll explain that in a moment. Um, but you shouldn't worry about that right now. And then y points is basically the same thing, uh, except it's uh, the other way around. Zero, so, so it's like one is a row and one is a column now. And then um, for xs, uh, after we run mp.meshgrid, we have, it's a little bit hard to see, but each row is 0, 250, 500, 750. And then again, we have the same copy, 0, 250, 500 for every single row down. Uh, what's the shape of this? Uh, 41 rows and 21 columns. So 41 rows uh, represents uh, the y, uh, our like y part here, and then 21 represents the 21 buckets for x. Um, and then for y s is the same thing, um, uh, uh, or, or same same kind of matrix. Uh, except that for YS, we now have, instead of every single row to be 0, 250, 500, et cetera, is every column that's 0, 250, 500, et cetera. So um, we get some kind of matrix where uh, we have uh, 0, 250, et cetera, 0, 250, et cetera. Um, and then another matrix that is it's transposed, so it's 0, 250 downwards, 0 to 250. Uh, downwards, etc. Uh, and then eventually, when I'm accessing the grids, I basically have one index, uh, let's call that i, and another index, let's call that j. And these two indices are enough to access um, both values of these two matrices that I got from mp.meshgrid. Um, and then that's like my, my approach of getting the, the grid values um, from this bigger data set. Um, uh, and let's see, let's see. Any questions about mp.meshgrid by any chance? Um, it, it's basically converting like two vectors and then uh, it, it inputs two vectors and then um, like it repeats them um, such that we have duplicate. Like it, it can, it, so it, it gets every single combination between x and y together, um, uh, basically by outputting these two vectors so that you can access them. So, so. Um, if we got, like, I don't know, uh, this cell over here, we grab this one, but uh, we can also grab this cell over here and then this one, and then x will be 250 and then y is 0, um, et cetera, et cetera. And you eventually get every single combination. Cool. Um, let's see. So we get that. Um, here's the feature engineering part. Uh, uh, so x for every single x, we now uh, multiply by 500. For every single y, we multiply by 1,000. Um, and then we get the hour, weekday, day, month, and year features from uh, our daytime variable from uh, up over here. Um, as you can see, it's very easy to get these uh, once you convert to a daytime object. Um, let me run this. Cool. <laughs> Uh, and now here comes the, uh, I guess, non-normal uh, non approach to doing the train and test split. Um, usually for train and test, you want to randomly select your subsets of train and test, like 80% to 20%. Um, in this case, um, uh, so that's the normal way. In this case, uh, you want to do it by time. Uh, and the reason uh, you want to do that is because uh, we want to replicate the real test set as much as possible. Um, 
and that everything is chronological from like time zero to time uh, whatever one billion. And if you randomly like choose uh, uh, each row, you're not capturing the time dependency part of the data um, that adequately. Uh, and so when you do eventually test on the uh, test set, um, the test set will now be all values of time that is much farther than the, zero, than the first time value. And so in order to mimic the, uh, the time exposure um, as much as possible, we split the train test sets by time. So let me just illustrate that here. Uh, let's say it was, um, I don't know, time was zero to 1,000 to make it simple. Um, so this is our training set. Our test set will contain values from 1,000 uh, one to, I don't know, uh, 1,100, or something like that. Uh, so this is the real test set, um, and this is our training set over here. So if we want to do the validation approach, we want to mimic this like layout of this chronological time period over here um, by splitting, not randomly, but splitting it right over here to be um, all the training data between 0 to 900, and all the test data to be, our local check test data to be 900 to 1,000. Does that make sense for people? Uh, you, c you can do it the other way by randomly like, splitting, but that does not mimic the, uh, it won't give you the testing environment that mimics um, the public leaderboard that well. Yeah. So is this assuming that the data is chronological like, by time? Yeah, yeah, so that's assuming that the data is chronological by time. Um, and I mean, we kind of just guess that would be the case. So, um, and it's implied by the variable called time. But people have tested this, so and they do, do they do realize that if you break up this chronological structure and test uh, do run the models anyways, uh, you get poor uh, reflection between local validation and the actual public leaderboard. So that that kind of verified it. Cool. Uh, uh, okay. So this is why we have split t over here. So I'm going to arbitrarily uh, split the time to be 730 k. Um, I think the time runs from between zero to uh, 900 something K. Um, anyways, uh, features contains a list of all the features that I want. Uh, so X, Y, hour, day, weekday, month, year, and accuracy. And then finally, place ID, uh, which isn't a feature but the response value. Um, anyways, so now I'm just gonna split my uh, train set to local train, local test, like I had over here, uh, based off the time value. So this is what the, uh, these two lines do. Let me run that. Cool. All right, so um, uh, the actual code is like down over here uh, where I've iteratively go through all the grids, but I'm gonna show you what happens for every uh, for an individual grid first uh, so that you, you guys understand what the for loop does. So um, score, total, uh, cumulative scores are all initialized first. Uh, score will be your APK score. Uh, total will be the number of grids that we have that we'll keep track of. Uh, and cumulative scores is basically, I'm gonna store all of the individual APKs um, as I generate them individually uh, into this list over here. Um, this is just for like plotting purposes at the very end to see like how the trend, uh, trend of AP scores uh, go over time. So um, I equals zero, J equals zero. I'm just gonna initialize this to be the zero zeroth grid over here. And then um, subset is basically uh, creating my local, uh, so so basically it, within this grid, I capture about 80% of the data, and then have another like 20% as text over here. Um, uh, uh, for, uh, so, so so do you guys do you guys understand like that? Like I'm trying to split it uh, by by training on just this portion and then testing on this portion. Um, so so let's see. Um, X, uh, so X, S, I, J will now grab zero over here. And then we do the same thing for Y. So uh, basically these, uh, these two things uh, uh, are zero. So local train dot X uh, that is greater than or equal to zero. And then local train dot X that's less than I plus, uh, I, J plus one. So J, um, J corresponds to columns. So now I'm gonna look at the next one, or the next column inside my matrices over here. So it's basically trying to read, okay, any X value that is uh, greater than or equal to zero, but less than 250. Mm -hmm. um, and then for the Y values, it's going to be, um, uh, I think I reverse indices, so it's actually grabbing this one over here. 
this one. Uh, and then for the y values, anything that is greater than or equal to zero but less than 250. So I get this grid over here. Um, uh, yeah, I, I reverse it here. So i j plus one will get 250. i plus one j will get the other two, uh, 250. Uh, and so this reads, uh, again, x that is greater than or equal to zero but less than uh, 250. Uh, and this alludes to the reason why I initially appended uh, another 250 um, in the, oh, I lost it. But for the x points over here, the reason why we had like an extra uh, number above 5,000 was because um, the way I coded it was that um, uh, I had um, the, the, the lower bound to be a greater than or equal to, but the upper bound to be less than, uh, strictly less than. So, uh, in order to accommodate the uh, points that happen to be on the actual edge, uh, the very edge of the grid, uh, like over here, um, then I needed to uh, append um, just something very small to the very last element of that list so I can uh, include those as well. Um, cool. And then um, do the same thing for the test, uh, test subset um, uh, for the local test over here. Uh, and now we have basically a train set and test set uh, within a grid. Does that make sense for people? Yeah. So is that the same subset and test subset? Uh, so subset is a data frame. Um, here, let me show you. Are you, are you saving the actual point? Yeah, let me show you. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm saving basically a subset of my local train data. Um, that has x values between 0 to 250 and y values between 0 and, zero and 250. If we do find the shape of this guy, uh, it's roughly 30, 36k um, from a local train of this big number. Uh, and then the test subset is a bit smaller, 3,133. Why uh, so many fewer of these guys over here? Uh, it's because, so for local train, let's see. Uh, so how we split, so, so how we made the local train was we split all of the data um, according to this time split over here, according to the time. So roughly 90% of the data is between zero to 900. Uh, and then the other 10% comes between 900 and 1000. So already we're splitting this like 30 billion uh, uh, point space uh, into something like 27 billion uh, in the train and then only three billion uh, on the test, for, for the local train and local test. And now we're splitting that even further um, by converting this, uh, this like x, y grid into uh, roughly, uh, what's the number? Like 40 times 25 different buckets. So which is why we have, like the test subset is already, like the local test size is already much smaller than the local train. And then we're splitting that even further by using this grid system, um, which is why we have so few points now. Um, and this is intentional, because we don't want to run KNN on the entire space. That will take centuries, or I don't know, years maybe. Um, so, uh, so this at least is manageable uh, computationally. Um, cool, any other questions? All right, um, so once that is taken care of, um, then we, now, so for the subset that we got from our train, um, we now store the, re the y values that we want. Uh, we now save our classifier that we want. I'm just, I just chose 40 arbitrarily for the number of neighbors. Uh, you can play around with this number uh, when you're actually doing things. Um, and then CL CLF.fit to be a uh, subset. And now since our features originally had um, place ID over here, we don't want to include place ID as a feature because uh, that, that would leak, um, that's a serious information leak. So um, this syntax basically removes the last element of that list uh, and only subsets the subset data frame to only include the features that we want. Uh, and so CLF to fit uh, will grab that training data, the response uh, variable that we had up here. Uh, it will fit the classifier. Then we do CLF dot predict proba. Proba, this, this function will predict the probabilities from KNN um, and feed the test subset um, data frame. Again, removing the last feature, or the last uh, uh, column because it's not a feature, uh, uh, into this uh, prediction uh, method. 
and then I output uh, uh, all the predictions in all preds. So let me show you what that looks like. Um, all preds is now actually an array or a matrix. Uh, and the dimensions are 3,133 by 872. Uh, so first off, uh, these two numbers are the same because each row corresponds to each row of the test set. Um, 872 corresponds to the number of unique place IDs we have now. So uh, what this does is that uh, we fed, so the training set that we fed into the classifier had 872 unique place IDs. And then what it generated was probabilities of those 872 uh, and put them inside this matrix, such that every column is now um, a, a unique place ID, and then each element inside the, that, that column corresponds to probabilities corresponding to um, a particular row of that test set. So now we have the predictions um, from each row, uh, or, uh, or each row ID uh, corresponding, uh, and, and I have the predictions for every single class um, within, within this grid over here. So, um, and any questions about that? All, all following, kind of? Sure, okay, cool. Um, let me show you guys real quickly what that looks like. Uh, oh yeah, so it, it's not really that informative if we just print out what, uh, what the elements are, but uh, it, it's because most of these 872 um, are zero because uh, KNN said oh, it's not really close to anything, um, or the row ID is not really close to anything, but um, we we'll see how we would do when we uh, actually test or verify um, that these probabilities are accurate. So, um, all right, so what I have over here, basically uh, I have this array. Um, uh, so we have this matrix. Um, we have a row ID over here. Um, we have 800 something columns. And then most of these uh, elements inside each column are going to be zero, but some of them are not. Some of them are going to be like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then basically we want the place IDs that correspond to the um, highest probability value um, for, for each row ID. So in order to do that, um, you want to iterate through every single row of that array and then sort them uh, to, to grab um, the, most, the, the highest probability for each row. Um, so uh, what this line does is uh, for record in, so, so for every single row in uh, my all preds, I access that row, uh, do an arc sort. Arc, arc sort is basically like sort, but it gives the indices of the sort algorithm, not the actual sort of list uh, itself. So uh, for example, if it happened to be that um, uh, it was 0, 0 0.1, 0, 0, and 0 0.2, then it will say that it will return uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It will return 4, uh, then 1, and then uh, random stuff over here. Um, and if you in input these indices, like say if you grab this, like, this row over here as its own list, if you try to select the list um, by the indices that our sort gives, it will return the list in the order, um, oh, well, in descending order in this case, um, from 0 0.2, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, uh, et cetera. So um, I'm not sorting, I'm just getting the indices that will make it sorted. Does that, th does that make sense for people? Kind of? All right, uh, so that's what arc sort does. Then I grab the last three guys. So um, I did this in the wrong order. Uh, the default for arc sort is that it will give you um, the least value first. So there will be like random indices over here, and then uh, one and four. Uh, and then I want to grab the last three indices because those three indices will correspond to the highest probabilities. Uh, so that's what this negative three co uh, colon stands for. Um, and then I reverse that, that order so, uh, so that the indices Instead of being, being from least to greatest, it would now be greatest to least. So it would be like four, one, and whatever this was. So does that make sense for people? All right, so that's stored into top three uh, IDX, and that's, a, I'm pretty sure, a list. And then um, uh, in order to 
Uh, so, so in order to grab, the reason why I have the index is because I don't care about these values. All I care about is the place IDs corresponding to these values. So now that I have the index that uh, corresponds to the highest probabilities, I can now grab not this row, but the column names, uh, and then index the column names. And whichever column that contains the fourth uh, element uh, corresponds to the column with the highest probability in the first row. So um, in order to get the classes, there's, uh, let me show you how to get that. Uh, that's what clf.classes is. Uh, and then these are, it will give you the list of classes that, uh, in order that uh, produce that matrix. So this one is the first one, this is the second, et cetera, et cetera. Does it make sense for people? And then basically the four, one, et cetera, indices that we got, uh, we're subsetting the classes column, uh, the classes variable instead uh, to get the top place IDs um, according to each row in the matrix. Um, cool, and then that will be its own list. It will be in Preds. Um, and then uh, I won't go over how the AP APK function works, but it will give you the, uh, the error that you have or the accuracy that you have um, by giving it the actual uh, place ID that corresponds to that particular row, uh, feeding in your predictions, and then setting like how many predictions there were, uh, in this case three. Uh, and this will give you an APK score. Uh, you add that score to score. You inc increment the total by plus one. And then, and then you print this average, a score. In this case, we're just running one cell. So if you score divided by one, so we get the score back. So um, if you run this, we get an ABK uh, 0 0.5078199, uh, uh, which I think is pretty bad compared to the rest of the scores. But this is just one cell. So. Um, uh, yeah, so that's basically what one grid does. Does that make sense for people? Any questions? Because now I'm going to show you like how to iterate this through. So basically, I had ij equal, is equal to zero up here, um, and then I just set that to be its own like two for loops. Um, uh, and if you run this, it will basically run every single uh, do the same algorithm for every single um, grid like that. Yeah, so uh, that's basically it. Any questions? And, and this is how you like validate whether your model does well or not. So uh, eventually, like this will probably converge down to like 0.46 or probably lower. I'm not sure, uh, since this is the cumulative AP, AP score for uh, each grid. Um, and uh, any like any feature engineering that you do or any other weird stuff that you do to this data set, um, you can run like this cell over here. Uh, check to see if the APKs, um, like in general, change. Um, what uh, the, uh, the 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 um, the good part of like showing the AP scores for every single grid uh, is because uh, running this in its entirety uh, for all the data points will probably take a long time. So verifying whether your model was working or not will uh, like you'll, it will take a very long time for you to figure out whether it worked or not. So printing out the results uh, of your model for every single grid will tell you roughly um, how well it would do like for the entire space. So if you saw that this was like point, I don't know, point two or something like that, you know you did, you did something wrong. Uh, and you can just stop the process um, uh, immediately for that one grid and then figure out what you did wrong. Um, and then you uh, rerun everything again. So. Uh, this is one out of many different ways that you could have solved this problem. This is just the approach that I had um, over the summer. Um, and it, it worked for me. So, any, any questions? All right, how are we doing on time? Perfect. All right, cool. We're done.
Hey Phil, how do you stop quick time? Quick time? Like I'm at quick time. Wait, I, I can't access anything. I'll just. Hey.